All right, Michael, how's it going? Good, thank you. Uh, we just talked before the interview, and I was kind of telling you how I'm a little bit nervous about this call because we have some questions about virtual reality. And my experience and knowledge pretty much goes from about Captain EO to Matrix. Um, <laughs> I've never seen a VR set. I've never put one on. Uh, you know, I've seen Avatar, but I, that's about as far you as I haven't go. seen. You haven't put one on yet. I have not put one on yet. And I'm, a, I'm kind of ashamed wow. to say so because no, everybody just ashamed. keeps on telling me how cool they are. And I was Let's talking. Let's go do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> here, I got, I got my Vive right here. Oh, nice. <laughs> we can put it on you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really cool. Like uh, the first time you do VR, first time you experience, it's, it's just such a, um, this generation of VR, like there's been attempts before with like the Nintendo Power VR and all these right. kind of things. But nothing has, has come close to what they've done. They've really kind of nailed down the formula with these uh, VR headsets. And that's why they're kind of exploding right now. That's what everybody says is the experience. And they'll tell you about the experience, but it's still at least to me, it doesn't make sense at all. And I'm assuming that's until you try it for yourself. But like, I still have no idea what people are talking about, what's going on in there and how it works. Yeah, it's, it's just basically like, um, I don't know how long you've been playing video games, probably since a child, right? <laughs> but um, I remember, had the original Nintendo. So the okay, original NES, go. that was me. Right? So, so you remember the transition going from um, Nintendo games and Mortal Kombat and Super Mario, those real kind of um, 2D, Sprite right. games over to 3D when Sega started to introduce Daytona and Virtual Fighter and Tekken and Toshinden and remember those? Yep. Like early days of that. Well, that's kind of the transition from 2D to 3D. That's kind of where we're at um, with this. And Star Fox and Wave Race 64, Super Mario 64, if you remember all those. So the, um, the jump is like that. It's, it's a pretty big jump going from traditional 3D over to VR. Uh, it's using the same kind of tech. You're, using an, you're in a 3D space, but the objects look as if they're in front of you, just as if you're looking at your computer desk that's in front of you right now, right? right. You move your head, your desk is still here. You move your head that way, your, your desk is still there and, and those items are there. Whereas when you're looking at a flat screen on a TV and, and you're playing a 3D game, it's, it's still two-dimensional. Right. Right. So those listening can probably already tell that you have a lot of experience with uh, consoles, older games. You've been in, I think, game development for around 11 years. How 15. did you? 15 years. Yeah. So give us a quick uh, background about yourself and how you got into apps. Okay. Um, quick background. So I started out in game development back in 2001 and I worked for EA Westwood Studios and um, I just kind of worked, I got in as a 3D artist and I just kind of worked my way up from there, working for various studios throughout the years, worked myself into a lead position of an artist. Back in 2010, when I was a lead at uh, Instant Action, we were working on a, a Facebook Guitar Hero-like rhythm game that was for Facebook. Okay. It sounds kind of um, quirky, but um, it was actually really cool. But we were, we we're a month away from launch and the studio closed down, right? There was a big call from the executive saying, hey, shut it down. And um, so everyone was kind of jobless at this time. And I had been developing an app on the side with uh, my programming partner. Because um, we started this, we started a side company back in 2009 with the idea to get into apps. And um, so we developed this game called My Virtual Girlfriend. And it wasn't real popular at the time. And since I was a lead artist at this other studio, um, we're talking back in 2010, um, I was focused on, you know, that aspect, you know, my career in there. So the, the game was just a side project. We put it in the app store. It wasn't getting a lot of downloads or anything. So it's 2010. Uh, you're trying your first simulation app. Is this your first app in the app yes. store? Yes. It was our very first app. And, um, it took us a little over a year to build it. So we started it in 2009, but it was 2010 before it got released. And then later on during that year in 2010, the studio I was working for closed down. So I had a choice of either going out and putting my resume together and, and building up my art portfolio and then submitting demo reels to a bunch of different studios and then probably relocating because there isn't a lot of jobs here in Vegas um, 
for video game development, right? Studios. Right. Were you looking for strictly in the mobile field or just any console? No, anything. Well, I wasn't looking. So I had, I had a choice to make. I said, I'm, I'm either going to um, go out and put my resume out and, and focus on that, take a month, because it's going to take a solid month to be able to find a new job, or right. I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket and I'm going to try and make this game work because it was only bringing in 10 bucks a day, which wasn't just enough to survive off of, right? And that's between after me and my partner were splitting the money. So we're getting like five bucks a day off. Right? So I said, okay, this game has a lot of potential, but it needs some work. Um, there is a lot of interest in it. It was getting downloads, but it wasn't monetizing well. Um, so what we did was I said, hey, um, you know, I lost my job today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this app work. You know, I'm not going to go the resume route. I'm not going to go back into the, the field. I'm going to make this work. What I need to do is figure out a way to market this. So I um, started. What's your, what's your experience before this 2010? Uh, are, you, are you programming? Are you designing? Are, no, do you have any experience art. with monetization? Just, just strictly mm -hmm. art and design. That's the, yep. the complete knowledge that you have. Mainly art. My first foray into game design was this actual game. Because when I was working at studios, I was always a production artist or a lead artist. Right. So, so what I did was um, I started learning about marketing and how to really, um, what I needed to do to get this app to be seen. And once I started doing that and I came out with a press release and I came out with video and I put better screenshots in and we did an update to the app and we lowered the price and we, we did all this stuff, right? And, and it's happened around the same time that my partner had um, lost his job due. So we had some free time on our hands to try and make this work. So I gave myself a month to do this. And in that month, um, we released the update. And when we did, we did some really heavy marketing with it, you know, kind of guerrilla marketing, not throwing a lot of money at it, just kind of all indie marketing stuff. And from that, um, it caught the attention of George Lopez, who's a comedian, right? Right. George Lopez. And he did like a one minute monologue about the game. Like I timed it. It was on his show, right? He, he joked about it for a solid minute. And um, because of that, then there was like the spill off media that was catching on to it too, right? Um, the idea, the concept of a virtual girlfriend is shocking just hearing that, you know, it's, it's different than say, Hey, I made a game, you know, about a platformer where you got to make this ball go through, you know, points, oh, yeah. you know, it, this is something that people are like, what? Well, most yeah. recently we just had, what was the Joaquin Phoenix movie, uh, her, I never right. saw it. It was a virtual girlfriend and it right. was people were just talking about it because it was just so bizarre and obviously what right, right. is bizarre already but it's kind of this concept <laughs> of you know their ex, ex machina too i think was another one that ex came machina. Out really yeah yeah that was a really good movie yeah. um so anyway the, the concept we wanted to leverage that and, and and i didn't mind negative publicity or positive publicity i just wanted publicity any way i could get it you know because right. i think that there's enough interest there then it could start making sales and that would allow us to sustain ourselves as developers, as indie developers. And so that's what happened. Um, it spilled off into Kotaku and then after Kotaku, no, MSNBC and then Kotaku. And once that's, the ball started rolling, it started picking up momentum. And once that started to happen, um, it started getting downloads and sales. And then we just kind of kept pushing it every month, you know, and I would go through and I would do a lot of social media marketing, you know, really using that channel. Um, to get the word out and continue with that. And then I would just spend on, on pushing the envelope to see. Yep. To see yes. how much. And that, that was five years ago. And I've been doing the exact same thing ever since. And I've been making about the same amount of money ever since the wow. game has been nonstop um, doing good for us. So that's where we're at with it. Yeah. It's now, now it has um, between that and the other games that have spawned off with it, the virtual boyfriend, and um, I love Chantel Jeffries, et cetera. Uh, there's currently between all of our games, there's a combined 8 million downloads. Wow. And how many games do you have total? That's, this is with the wet production still? Yeah, that's f four. Four games. Four games, 8 million downloads. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. I've been, I've, a lot of people in our community too have been in that place where they obviously need some extra income. Who doesn't? But in my case, I was telling you before our call, I was in Santa Barbara. Uh, I wanted to get in the tech industry. I find myself working with Chad Moretta as an administrative assistant position. Um, 
our partnership with my, my employers breaking up. So I confronted Chad, I had no app experience. And like you said, you have to make it work. You know, I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know anything about design and a lot of this stuff. I mean, it it isn't that difficult. It's just a lot of elbow grease. And while we're not, I don't recommend people who have lost a job to put all of their, their money. Yeah. Yeah. All of their marbles into apps. But, um, there's something to say when, when you need to make this work. Yeah. Uh, I was talking the other day to our buddy, Evan, who did Swimoji, and he had this idea for this swimming app and the Olympics are coming around and he's like, this is it. Like, this is ready to drop it to fifth gear and get this baby out there. So I know how it feels. It was, it was a pivotal moment. It was sink or swim for me, you know, and I really, I was like, man, I've been doing this for 10 years. You know, I've been working for various studios and I don't have creative freedom to be able to do what I want because I'm a, I'm a production artist, right? You know, or right. I was a lead artist. I had some creative freedom, right? You know, I set the, the tone of what the, uh, the games would look like, but I wanted to design my own games and you can't do that when you're not a lead designer at a studio, you know? You can have input on game ideas and whatnot, but you really got to, if, if you're going to, if you want to build something out that you have an idea for, you got to kind of do it yourself. So that's where I was. And I said, this is what I want to do. I know the game has potential. I'm just going to market the hell out of it. And, you know, let's see what happens from there. And if I, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't accept failure. I wouldn't accept failure. And it, and it didn't happen. Right. So you have these two apps. Now you have the virtual girlfriend, you have the virtual boyfriend, um, this, what, what kind of brought you in the simulation, simulation category? Why are you interested in these simulation apps? And I guess it's kind of a good segue into virtual reality. Yeah. Um, so what brought me there was, well, we were, we were actually, me, me and my partner were developing a game called Girl Fight prior to that. And it was supposed to be a humorous, all female fighting game. It was going to be in 3D. We were developing it for PC, uh, but we wanted to put it on consoles. And I had shopped that around to publishers for years and no one would buy into it. So it's too controversial. It's too sexist. It's too this, it's too that. And you don't have a big enough team. There's only two of you. I mean, we put together a demo. We, uh, we did a lot of stuff, but we couldn't get funding for it. And back then you got to remember a game engine, like, um, the ones that were available, Gamebryo and Unreal, these, these to license these were 250 grand for a license wow. of it. it. It's not like Unity is today where, you, hey, we'll let you put it out for free unless you have a million um, downloads and then you can start paying us a percentage. It wasn't like that. Right. They didn't have those deals going on. So in order to get, um, to get a game made, you have to go up, approach a publisher and you have to pitch them and you have to say, hey, I need you know, $3 million or $5 million, <laughs> right? And extracting that kind of money from anyone is, is a difficult task, right? So, you know, nobody was buying into it. And that's when we said, well, let's bring this game over to mobile. But that's right when the app store was brand new back in 2009, right? Mm-hmm. And um, because of, because of, it was, it was nothing, it was failure after failure after failure after failure, just pitching this idea to these publishers and nobody would do it. So we said, well, let's do it on our own through mobile. And that's what got us into mobile. Now, what happened was um, when in 2009, the Apple started doing the purge of any sort of controversial apps. I mean, there was like a bikini pillow fight app that got banned or something. I mean, stuff that I wouldn't consider to be really bad or anything, but they went like really ruthless and just banned 5,000 apps from the App Store. And I said, well, our game is a little bit on, you know, the you know, girls in bikinis fighting each other and stuff. And so I said, well, that's probably not going to fly with them. So um, rather than try and push that, how can I pivot this game into a way that's allowed to be on the app store that meets their standards um, and still gets, you know, downloads and still kind of keeps with that theme and maybe we can reuse some of the art assets so what happened was there was this other game on the app store and i was browsing through the store and it was called um i girl i think and i read an article how this guy had like a million downloads off this app within like a month because this was when the app store was brand new right and all it was was a 3d girl with an the camera being animated going around this character in a circle and that was it. There's no interaction, no nothing. I said, my God, and the art was terrible, right? So I said, I can do better than this. You know, let's, what if we create a, a, a girl and um, 
We can use some of the characters that we're using in my existing fighting game, right? The all-female fighting game. We'll just dress them up in clothes instead of bikinis. And, and uh, we'll make her more interactive so that she's act, you know, um, interacting with the, uh, the player. And that's kind of what spawned the idea of my virtual girlfriend. So it was, it was kind of a pivot into that space. Yeah, it's especially in the early days, but still now with templates, it's, it's basic market research where you take something that's working, you emulate that model, and then you innovate it. You make it better. You take it. You innovate it. Yeah, that was the that key word there, yeah. And I think, uh, I'm going to use the term back then, back in 2009 or 2010, but you didn't have as much of an audience to pull from as much information as we do now with the Facebook no. campaigns and all the audience and the lookalikes and everything. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, we do have all of these reviews and all of these campaigns that we can do uh, to essentially do what you did back then, which is take this app that's already successful. Uh, it's a low hanging fruit as far as budget. It's easy to make. It's kind of a low risk. You already have assets for it. And right. then you innovate it to get to the next level. Yep. So that's exactly what we did. We pivoted and we, and we pushed it out. And even after that, it was, it was met with failure. When it was released on the app store, it wasn't getting much attention again, because I wasn't marketing it at the time. So it was the combination of that. But this is like the Angry Birds story. You know, everyone sees the success of Angry Birds, right? But mm -hmm. there's, there's how many games did they do to get up to that point? Like 60 or something, right? And they, and they were like right on the very verge of, of folding. And that's kind of the same thing that was happening with me. This game was 10 years in the making. If you, if you look at all the events that led up to it, you know, after, after coming up with my own deal with my partner and forming our own game engine and trying to pitch an idea to publishers and just failure after failure after failure and then pivot and then failure and then pivot and then failure. And finally, we, we reach a, a point of success. But it's, it's the um, expectation that if you're going to put something out there and this is your first app or this is your first try at something and it's just going to be awesome. Right. Uh, and then you fall on, you know, you fall on your face and you say, shit, it wasn't what I was hoping it would be. That's the point when you have to pick yourself up and you have to say, okay, how can I rework this or how can I reapproach it or how can I go a different route? You know, um, there's a saying in the uh, boxing and MMA. It's, it's not how hard you hit it's how hard you get hit and then get back up that's what makes for a good boxer so you have to be able to take those punches and you have to get back up every time yeah i agree if you look at the developers who are the top charts or if you look at the people in our community who are the most successful you can watch people grow and the biggest thing the biggest attribute that these people have is like you said, they get knocked down and they keep going. They're yeah. not afraid to ask stupid questions. They're not yeah. afraid to work on a failing project or share their information. It's just the people that uh, keep fighting back, keep learning and keep improving on, like you said, on their app. I think every day I get emails about how much or what, what app can I develop that'll give me a hundred dollars or how can I get my first million downloads? And it's, it's like your first app isn't really made to make That's yeah, it's only it's only a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's only opening up a door. You you have to get the experience and keep going. I used to, um, and I'm probably going to do a, pick it up again. I used to host a show on um, PS4 live stream called Chat with a Game Developer, and you know people come at me with questions, and a lot of people want to be game developers, right? You know, not just app developers, but game developers in general, mm -hmm. because people have ideas. You know, people are creative, and they want to see their ideas, you know, come to reality. And they say, hey, I have this idea for it's Grand Theft Auto meets Call of Duty meets Star Wars meets. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> okay, first of all, um, it's not going to happen. You, you, you want to start off? You're going to start off with a tic-tac-toe game. That's what you're going to start off with. And, and when you can produce that on something, you know, a, a mobile app or a web browser, then go on to something a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. Learn from the experience. Take that back and then go on to something. And each one of these are stepping stones. Nobody starts off doing that. It's, of it's difficult for people to, I mean, it's good that they aspire to get those positions, but you really have to work your way up and earn it. Right. You, know, you have to earn the respect of the players and the team and everyone else. Same goes for uh, game design and development. People don't start off being the idea guy. You know, they have to work up to that position. That's called like a lead designer, a creative director on a project. You have to 
pay your dues as a tester, learn design, pay your dues as a designer, work your way up into the position of a lead design. And then you can start generating your own ideas. And then even then you got to pitch it to the company and the executives and the publishers. You know, it's right. no, nobody's just going to throw money at you just because, hey, you're a lead designer at something. They, they want to make sure that whatever you're coming up with is commercially viable. Right. So you and your partners, you're flat out of luck. You had to put all of your marbles into wet productions. You got these two apps running. You made some pivotal moves. You're seeing some success now. Uh, what happens next? What projects are you working on? And how does uh, eye candy fall into place? Okay. So coincidentally, um, my my partner is branched out on his own, started up a new uh, game company because he wanted to be able to do his own creative direction. And in wet productions, I'm the creative director and he's the programmer. But now he's feeling, hey, I want to be able to do my own things too, right? So he branched out, started his own company and he wanted to stay more into the mobile app space. So he has Crime Coast and um, his company is called Pixel Squad and they come out with Crime Coast. It's kind of like a clash of the clans meets Grand Theft Auto type of game. And so he's kind of going in that direction. And since he's done that, it kind of leaves me programmerless at Wet Productions. <laughs> and <laughs> so I've started, uh, I started my own, um, I asked him, I said, hey, you want to, collaborate on VR and he, and he wasn't ready to make that move. So I started my own company called Eye Candy Games and that's a new startup and I'm going to be focusing on VR games. And where does wet production sit at this point? It's for sale. So the company, the IP, everything with it, it's, it's just kind of been um, sitting. I mean, it's still, it's making money, you know, but um, we're not actively doing a lot with it right now. Right, and that, that's really common with, with networks as well. It's like some of these networks, you just don't want to keep working on them. You want to shift, you want to work on your own stuff. And even like you said with your partner, partnerships don't last forever. They don't, yeah. If you, How long did you work with your partner uh, at what productions? Well, we, we started um, our partnership back in 2003 right. when we were trying to pitch this game. Yeah, my but, point is like I, I, I've never worked with a programmer for – more than two years, let alone the 10 years that you guys had together. And, and what, what I'm talking about here is just keeping on track, trying new things, evolving. Um, I think I've started and sold over six app companies. This doesn't have to be something that you just stick to and you have to yeah. keep working on your one game. You can, you can move into different directions. You can let that sit in the shelf for a while. You never know right. what's going to come back. You might get re-engaged or it might be yep. trending again. Um, that's kind of where we're at with it. It's, it's sitting on the shelf right now. When he, when, I think when VR starts to pick up momentum in his eyes, he's probably going to reapproach me and say, hey, we need to bring these games over to VR. And it's going to be fairly easy because they're already 3D games. It's a matter of dropping a new camera in and, and basically redoing the UI and then some other minor tweaks. But we could definitely do that. Right. Um, but I, actually, I would want to create a, an, an even better version, like a My Virtual Girlfriend 2.0. I wouldn't want to settle for, you know, what's currently there because it's already kind of five years old. And, and although it's had its updates, it's, it was limited by the, um, by the initial tech. So when we first put this out, it was iPhone 2. And so that's our min spec. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the terminology of min spec, but it means the minimum specification of what you're going to be putting it, your, your games out on, right? Got it. Yeah, so back to your new, your new direction now without throwing you under the bus because I don't know how much you know about VR, how many projects you have out there, if you have any projects out there. Yes. Uh, what are you geared towards now and what are you working on? So um, right now I'm working on a, um, this is my entry level game. And just like I was saying before, because this is entry level and I'm new to VR, you know, um, this space specifically, I'm not new to game development or 3D, but I'm new to right. VR. I wanted to get my feet wet with, not with a non-experimental game. I wanted to do something that was already existing. It was, you know, a game type that people were already familiar with, something that was, um, that people like, you know, and are familiar with. And so I chose a blackjack game. Mm -hmm. And I actually, um, I can actually show it to you, right? I'll give you a little preview of it. So yeah. you'll, be, you'll be the actual first one to see <laughs> the development um, thing live. So I, I got it here up and running on Unity. And I'm just going to switch my screen over here. I hope you don't mind I do it like this. Yeah. 
Sweet. So a little bit, a is... little bit higher, a little bit higher for us. Uh, okay. Let me see. Is that better or worse? That's better. If you can do a half an inch high, there you go. Perfect. Is that it? Okay, cool. So um, this is the, the scene in Unity. If you can see it. Kind of Explain to people really quick uh, what Unity, Unity is. Obviously, it's a oh, gaming engine, but... It it's a gaming engine. And um, these are all like 3D objects within the gaming engine that I created, right? So mm -hmm. I you know, created a floor and some slot machines and whatnot. And your, this is not any code work right here. You're, you're primarily a designer. This is all of your design work. Correct. Correct. So I created, I created the character, created all the assets you see in here, and then did the animations. Now, the neat thing is, is um, the game when you, um, it's really, Unity is really a friendly um, app game, um, game engine for designers, right? So you can do a lot with it. Um, you can actually create your own games, you know, very simple, not a lot of custom work, but you can create your own games without having to know a ton of code or any code for that matter. Um, everything is pretty much run through scripts. So here we have this, I'm gonna just hit play. And when I do, it's going to build out the game and then maximize the screen. You're gonna see it in VR. Now, um, it's very specific where my headset is placed because as you see here, I don't know if you can see the headset. <laughs> yeah. where, I, where I move the headset is, uh -huh how it looks so she's just kind of sitting there doing an animation kind of blinking so you can check the table next to you and see if that's a hot or warm table right while yeah. you're playing here <laughs> sure sure yeah, there's no there's no other characters in here but right. yeah so this is kind of where we're at and it's just a real early build of the game so she's going to do a little um car dealing right and are all of the, is all of this design work developed by you organically? Did you, I know that Unity has an asset store for 3D images. Can you use some of that stuff or do, do you have to create all of this stuff from scratch? You can use their stuff. And as a matter of fact, I recommend that to a lot of, um, I'm going to switch back to me here real quick. So I'll kind of give you a peek at that. Sure. Um, so actually the Unity asset store is a great place to start because they do have a lot of templates in mm -hmm. there for different things. And they have some, um, 3D game templates or VR game templates in there, as a matter of fact. This isn't though, this is, uh, this is all from scratch. Wow. Um, basically because I built out the scene and stuff, but they do have assets that you can download some free ones and some really cheap ones. You know, like I saw a VR, I think it was a motorcycle game in there and it was like 15 bucks. Yeah, I've seen virtual worlds where it's like a fantasy world or a fantasy uh, car, game, car driving game. And it's, again, like 30 bucks. You can buy custom characters for 10 or yeah. 20 bucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you would recommend using the asset store and that's a good place to start? Yeah, well, yeah. If you're going to be using Unity, you want to you wanna purchase um, any templates through the asset store in there. Right. Because yeah. I'm assuming if I were to hire somebody to create a virtual reality game design like you just showed me, that's going to cost me thousands of dollars, whereas I could go on a store first and get something to start with. Yeah, yeah. Well, you would, you would definitely want to talk with um, the developer to make sure that, that what you're looking to do overall fits within the scheme of what that template allows. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you can't deviate too far from the template, otherwise it would be like major code work. And then at some point, maybe the, the, the coder's like, ah, it's going <laughs> to write it all from scratch, you know? So it really depends. But yeah, definitely you'd want to uh, take a look at that and then have your coder look at that too. Awesome. So why did you, I mean, I, I think what I'm gathering is you, you're a huge game fan and you've kind of climbed up the ladder and just kept evolving with games. And that's why you're going into virtual reality. Yep. Um, it's just such an interesting thing because it's, it's so brand new. Like Oculus started, I think in uh, 2010 or 2012, these two guys in Irvine, it was a Kickstarter. Zuckerberg sees it, buys them out. And it's, it's just such a huge potential for mobile because we have these, these phones now that are so equipped with motion sensing with geo. I am, I am, it, Apple hasn't announced anything, but I am certain within my core, within my core that they have a VR device that they're probably working on under yeah. wraps, right? The, uh, the Android has the um, uh, Samsung gear and I don't have, I don't have a Samsung phone, but I bought the gear. 
<laughs> I don't have a Samsung phone. I figured I would, I would buy one and test with it um, at some point. But fortunately, my, um, my programming partner that I'm working on this particular app with, which isn't through Wet Productions, through Eye Candy Games, um, he has a Samsung gear and he, and this is what it's being built on currently. And then right. I'm running it on my vibe. So, so, you, caught, so oh. you, you caught me with, uh, it's currently only on Android and what do you need? You showed us some, 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 uh, engines, obviously you showed us some equipment, but what do you need to develop games or apps for VR? Well, what I would recommend, well, okay. So what do you need? And what I would recommend, what do you need? You would need a, a VR device to test with, right? So a headset, um, if you have an Android phone and you want to produce this in the Google Play Store, then, you know, for the, uh, for the Samsung gear, right? You can do that. Um, you would need one of these, which is a um, hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. They actually have a newer model out now. And then you would need a... Uh, What's the I name of that one you just showed us? That is a Samsung Gear VR. Samsung Gear VR, okay. Now, there, there is um, also the Google Cardboard. Right. But... I've, I've tried Google Cardboard. I've tried Samsung Gear VR when I was at CES, besides not having an actual Android device to run it on here, but I've tried it. And it's actually really good. It's, it's, almost, it's almost as good as, not, I wouldn't say almost, but it's, it's just one step below these. It's one, give me one second, sorry. Sure. It's one step below Oculus and uh, Vive. And then the PlayStation VR is also coming out. So the, the Oculus one's hundred bucks. Uh, the Google Cardboard is free. Is that right? Yeah. Can you just well, go on to Google and apply for it, and they'll ship you one, or how does that work? Um, you know, you can buy them on Amazon.com. Okay. They're, you can buy ones that are like. Um, I got one of these. This is also considered a Google Cardboard. Um, it's just. It's even though obviously it's not cardboard. I got this off of Amazon for twenty bucks. Wow. So basically you, you slipped your phone in here. I got to take the, the case off this, but you slip your phone in here, right? Like this. And then you just kind of, I'd have to take the case off to show you that there's these, what happens is I'm, I'm going to kind of explain it how it works. You see these two eye ports here. Yep. Okay. Each one of these eyes gets a different camera in right. VR. And what happens is, each camera is slightly offset, just like your real eyes are. And so you see things in stereoscopic 3D. Now, in addition to that, when you turn your head, the object stays in world space. So as you're, as you're moving about in um, your local space, right, you're turning your head, the objects in the 3D world are staying stationary. So they're not, they're not tracking with this. They're, they're in their own kind of 3D world. So those com two combined things plus spatial sound really help to um, give the illusion that you're in a virtual world and that's what the current set of VR is doing. So Google Cardboard or this, right, you can, I, I don't know how you would actually obtain the actual Google Cardboard. I think it's just a template that you cut out of like a cereal box or something. Right. <laughs> I've seen YouTube videos too that you can actually make them from cereal boxes, I believe. Or, yeah, or maybe something like that. But I just bought this for 20 bucks. You know, it's just like a little device. You, you slip your phone into it and it works. It's, it's not the same experience as this, mm -hmm. right? The, the Vive or the Oculus. Um, but the Samsung Gear is um, probably what you would want to entry level at, you know, just kind of try that one out because that one's going to be impressive. This one isn't that impressive. You don't get a really big field of view and um, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's the Google Cardboard is the really low end of the spectrum of VR. So. Got it. So we have our uh, Google headset. We have our uh, development environment or engine like Unity. What else do you recommend using for uh, developing or designing a VR game? Yeah, that's it. That's really that's all it. you need. Yeah. So yeah, Unity and then like a um, like a Samsung Gear VR and then a uh, um, like a Samsung S6 or above uh, phone. And you just showed us on Unity what it looks like. Uh, is it any more complex if you have the assets to develop a game with VR to design a game for VR than it is if you're just designing a 3D game on Unity? Um, well. Here's the the main difference is going to be a couple things at least from an art standpoint. I can't I can't speak too much to code. I, I think code has to do a few little tweaks here and there, 
But the main difference is you set up an additional camera within the scene, okay? And then you install whatever plugin um, for whichever platform that you're developing for. For example, I installed the Steam VR plugin and it was literally as easy as dragging and dropping. Wow. So I didn't, I didn't code anything, I didn't do anything. I literally grabbed it, dragged it into the window and bam, it gave me the two camera system. And then when I hit play, it sends it over to my Vive and, and I'm running the game on the Vive. So it was that simple. Um, now, as far as UI goes, that's, that's a whole area because um, user interface within the VR environment is different than what you normally get on a mobile screen. What you, when you're working with regular mobile, you're working with um, a flat, uh, two-dimensional screen space that has a certain uh, pixel ratio, right? You know, like w what is it on uh, mobile, like 2,200 uh, something pixels wide by whatever tall, right? Right, 640, 1136. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 42 by 2208 right. or whatever, yeah. So, so when you're designing UI, you design it to fit the corners of that screen and within that framework. Right. In VR, you don't do that because everything is 360. So it's, um, there's different ways for people to do it, but you kind of want to design it so that it's not taking you out of the experience. You don't want to throw up a bunch of UI, you know, in front of the player because that's, it's kind of breaking the illusion of them being in a 3D world. You want, to, you want it to feel native and natural, like as if they're really in that VR world. So um, you can use 3D objects. Um, you don't want them to, there's, there's a lot of good design principles when it comes to VR. Like you don't want people to be able to have to turn their head 90 degrees just to look at a menu or something. You want, you know, things to pop up in the front and center. You want to be kind of minimal, minimalistic with your UI. Um, and I want to say that you, there's 3D, what I've done for this game is I've created um, on my Vive controller, um, I've created the UI so that it kind of projects out from the actual controller. So as you're holding the controller, it's kind of glued to your hand. That's where the UI is on this VR game. So when you want to bet or you want to hit or you want to stand, you do it all, you know, from your, your controller. Right. So that's different. It's different than touching the screen and tapping on buttons on the screen. Um, yeah, the navigation is, is different. The, um, the moving around, the, uh, the spatial relations between objects is different. So you need to really design your UI for VR. So you've talked a lot about the in-game UI design, but what about marketing? What ideas, what different strategies are you going to use for VR marketing? Oh, man. Uh, than you are, <laughs> I mean, again, I, <laughs> I'm not expecting some crazy answers because this is such a new space like we don't well, really have an idea how to market these games yet here's, what are here's, you here's the cool thing about that right um remember apps back in 2009 2010 and you just had these rising youtube stars who started talking about different apps and whatnot or um what's his name that that one swedish dude who's got like a gazillion subscribers right uh pewdiepie right mm -hmm. so he gets on there and he talks about games and whatnot um, all these people were rising up because there was new technology in place. There's a lot of excitement. Same thing is happening in VR space right now. You've got YouTubers that are dedicating themselves to VR and they're starved for content because there isn't a lot of VR content out there. So it's not like now if I take one of my apps and I, and I reach out to 50 YouTubers that cover apps there, you know, it's not even like that I'm going to get responses back half the time because these guys get blasted with requests like this all day long. Right. But the VR YouTubers, they're not getting blasted requests all day long because it's a new space and they're starved for content. So this works to my advantage in that aspect. Yeah. And that's, that's what we were talking about with movies earlier. And it just shows the demand already by the gatekeepers for apps like this. People are curious to see what these yeah. apps are going to do, what they look like. And people have no idea how they work. They have no idea how non-games are going to work. They have no idea what the equipment's going to turn into. Uh, so it's just a huge eye-catcher for all of these publishers. Yeah, it's, it's real, um, I want to say nebulous right now. Kind of, it's, everything's kind of shifting and forming. And there isn't, there isn't a lot of info out there. But, um, and there's a lot of experimentation going on to try and figure out what works and what don't. 
What I like to do, how I like to approach, is the same way I approach ideas for games or anything else. I go out and I just kind of dive into it and I, and I see what's being done. I went out and bought like 20 games on Steam that are VR games and I just experienced them. I said, okay, what's this one about? What's this one about? What, what do I like about this one? Just kind of really diving into it and, and seeing how they're doing their UI and seeing how they're doing their interaction and, and what they're doing with it. And the more you get into the space, the more you come up with ideas and how you can innovate on certain things. And that's where the creativity flows from. You know, you, you have this as kind of a reference point. It's all kind of experimental, but you, you start using that as a reference point and then you just kind of build off it. Right. So that's what I've been doing. And what about from your research from these games that you've downloaded and from, from your VR game, what are you doing differently, if anything, from the consumer standpoint? Are you going to have a different monetization system? Are you going to just have where they can buy more chips, I'm assuming, or they can <laughs> unlock more characters or a cuter dealer? Uh, yeah. How's the consumer side of things? So, so actually, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this really cautiously right now. Um, just, I'm not going to go the, the whole, I, I don't even know if there's any um, ad platforms out there. I, I asked, I think I asked Chart Boost because in VR space, they can't use a two dimensional bitmap right in front of the player space, you know, just to throw, hey, download this app. It doesn't really work like that there. So, I, I, because the way the camera system works with the two eyes, they, mm -hmm. you would have to create, well, I don't know. You'd have to be able to walk around the you'd have, I think advertisement, you'd have, essentially. Yeah, you'd have to create it in a 3D. Yeah, project. or have to stay in front of you or. I, I'm not sure how that's working. So I don't, I don't even know what we're going to do for monetization. So right now, that's awesome. We're approaching it is we're just going to have a flat price for the game. There's mm -hmm. not, and there's going to be unlimited chips with that. Now, later we may come out with a free version and then say, okay, buy this many chips. And after they get, you know, buy a certain amount of chips, then we'll just give them the free, you know, the game because they've already passed the, the point where they would have got, um, that same amount in, on the paid game, right? So we'll probably do it that way. We'll probably split it off into both a paid and a free version. That's worked for me with uh, my virtual girlfriend. Right, and that's just sticking with traditional models. And, that's, and you know by now that that's how all games start. They all use the previous model and then you evolve from there. Uh, what do you see happening? I mean, may, maybe in your dreams or in your wildest dreams with VR. I remember watching Back to the Future, what, like 30 years ago? <laughs> when yeah. our friend Marty is reading like newspapers and stuff's popping out. Like, where do you see this taking us the next six months, year, five years? Wow. So I'm really excited. This is the first generation of VR and um, it still has a long ways to go. There's, there's some, when you try your first VR headset, when you try a Vive or an Oculus, and I recommend that you do, you like after this interview or whatever, if you get some free time, find somewhere in town that has one of these demoing or a friend or something, go out and try it so you can experience it. Um, but there is a little bit of screen, I don't wanna say pixelation, but you, you see these little dots in the screen. It's almost like you're looking through a, a screen door, a little bit of that effect going on. So that kind of breaks the illusion. I think that, that they're going to eventually get past that and solve that um, in future iterations to really immerse you in there. Um, but it's not, it's not too bad. It's just a little bit, but you know, they, they kind of toned it down from, from the earlier versions of the Oculus and, and that, but so that's one thing. So in five, 10 years in the future, I think this is going to be really immersive. You're going to have, uh, you're probably going to, we're going to reach a maturity point where there's a lot of games, a lot of AAA games. Um, big publishers tend to you know, like the EAs and the Activisions and these kind of um, game space, they tend to stay away from the experimental stuff initially because it's high risk. So uh, they may put out one or two games just because it's part of their R&D department, but um, they're still focusing on what their bread and butter is, you know, which is, you know, the consoles and that. So here is a, a good opportunity for indie developers to jump in on a fresh space that isn't being, um, you know, overly saturated right now. Right. So that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is capitalize on that and, and get in early on this space. Now I got in fairly early on the, the mobile apps industry back in 2009, 2010, when we released our first game. And now I'm getting in on the VR 
early. I'm probably like the second wave, right? So there's already been the first wave and those guys are getting some pretty good downloads. I was looking at the numbers for the games that are being downloaded on Steam for VR and some of the top games had like 80,000 downloads and some of the lower games um, on that chart were at like 20,000 downloads. Now, mind you, they're not, uh, their monetization is basically a paid game, you know, like you pay 10 bucks, you pay 20 bucks for it, basically. So that's the method that they're using to monetize with. As this industry grows, I'm sure you'll see ad platforms coming out and, and um, you know, infiltrating this space and you're, and you're going to see a lot of stuff. A lot more freemium. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, you're going to see movies. Like I watched a movie on um, Gear VR that was so cool. It wasn't the full movie. It was, um, it was at CES early this year. The movie Wild with um, the, the girl who goes on a backpack into the country. Right. right. So they took a clip, a specific clip where she's talking with her mother and they, created that they they must have filmed it at the time they were filming the movie but they filmed it in vr specifically it wasn't included in the movie it was like its own little separate thing that they did but they did it during the time of filming and when i put on the samsung gear because it was a demo for the samsung gear to watch this movie i was in 3d space watching this movie now i was looking at i think it's reese witherspoon is mm -hmm. it correct right. yeah and she's talking, and she's talking right past me. She's looking at me. She's are, are you talking. taller than Reese Witherspoon? In the well, I was, I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting down on a rock or something. And, okay. And so, so I'm kind of in. A, so she's a little bit higher than me at this point, and I'm like, oh my god, this is crazy. And I'm looking around, and I'm looking at all the trees and, and the atmosphere. And then she's talking to, to, and I thought she was talking to me until I hear a voice behind me, and I turn around and I see it's her mother. And, her, and, then, and then I'm 180 and I face the other direction. I'm like, no way. And her mother starts her dialogue. And then, then I hear Reese say something back, you know, um, because she's having like a flashback and her mother kind of appears as a ghost or, or kind of a memory or something. So I'm, I'm positioned in between this conversation between these two and I'm flipping my chair, my swivel chair that I'm demoing this on uh, back and forth, 180 degrees, watching these two have a conversation. Um, it, from her own like memory of, of whatever this dialogue thing, this cut scene that they were doing for VR uh, for this demo. But it was really, really cool to watch a movie like this. And I was like, wow, this is, this is just bringing a whole new uh, space. Yeah, that's, that's trippy. Um, I think it just, it makes you think about how there's so much opportunity. It's not just apps. You could do movies. Maybe you have some background in surround sound. Right. Uh, maybe right. you're a marketer. Maybe you know exactly what this product needs to push it forward. And even in the app space, like we talked about advertising. Yes. Uh, you know, what if we're at your casino and we're, we're, we're in your game when you walk into another slots game and that in effect is chart boost pushing you towards Sodomania or whatever else. Sure. You do. Yeah, exactly. So there's just so much opportunity and we don't know what's going to happen next. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And if, if you have a question for mm -hmm. Michael or myself, we'll try our best to answer it uh, in the, either in the Blue Cloud Solutions Facebook group or on the uh, blog post page. But a couple of people wrote in, and the first question is, where is the information? Where are the guides? Where can developers uh, go find how to build these VR apps? Is there anything out there right now? There's not a lot of information. Um in the one space, like I don't even know if there's any books on it. There may be some books on it, um, but even if there is, it's it's probably very. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really new. It's a really new space. I do know that if somebody wants to find a VR developer, um, Meetup is a really great place for that. Um, there's a meetup here in Las Vegas called the VR Developers Meetup Group, and I've been attending that, scouting potential coders to work with on various projects that I'm working on. Now, I've been in the game industry for 15 years, so I, I know a ton of coders you know, that I've worked with at various studios. And really, you just need a, uh, an experienced 3D game coder to be able to do any of these things. They can for them to make the transition to a VR game is not going to be too difficult. They're, they're going to have to read some technical documentation and then install a few plugins and then they'll be, then they'll be going with it from there. Right. And uh, John asks, 
how do you incorporate panoramic photos into virtual reality? So I guess kind of like the movie we were talking about with Reese Witherspoon. Yeah. Okay. So here's how I think it works. Now I don't know for sure because I'm not on the, the film or the photography end of this, but I know in games, um, what we do is we take a, a bitmap texture and it's stitched together. So it's like a landscape texture with a, with a top and then a bottom. And then what we do is we map it to the inside of a cube or a sphere. And I believe the same thing is happening in VR. It's you're just looking at a texture that has been, um, the software has adjusted it so that it's pulled and pushed in the right areas, you know, like it's, it's pinched at the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the sides, it's a little bit um, curved. And I think when you're looking in VR space at a movie, uh, like a film or a, um, or a photo, right? It's a 360 degree photo. You're looking at it mapped to the inside of a, a 3D sphere or cube. Usually, usually a sphere under those circumstances. Yeah, I'll, I'll paste in a picture so, in the blog post to help explain so, to people. So you're in, in when it comes to um, movies, film and photos in VR, you're not, you're, you're not seeing the, the, all the objects in the scene within three dimensions, but you're seeing the scene itself in three dimensions. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are there other templates available? Can you go anywhere and purchase a VR template right now? Or is that not, not quite? No. Here? Yeah, there is in, in the uh, unity asset store, right? So first of all, let me just say that if, if you want to build a VR game, it has to be in 3d, you can't build a 2d VR game. Right. So if, if you have an idea, say, Hey, I want to go to, to Chupa mobile or one of these places and, and buy um, an app template and convert it to VR, it won't work unless it's already a 3d game. It has to be in 3d space, you know, like a temple run maybe. Right. right? Because that's a 3d space type of game. But you can uh, convert a 3d game into a VR game if that's yes. 3D or okay. Correct. And it also depends on the game. Like you can have a 3d, I don't know, a platformer, but maybe you're showing it in 2D space, right? Maybe you're just kind of having this character run. He's actually in 3D, but, he's, but you're playing the game as a 2D platformer. It, it could potentially go into VR, but it's still going to look like a 2D platformer because that's how that specific type of genre of game is designed. For you to get true depth, you know, um, or to experience it from a first-person perspective, you need like a first-person player type of game like a racing game or a uh, first person shooter or a first person flying game or similar right right so but they all have to be 3d yeah you have to have a 3d game and it does convert this was this um my game was simply a 3d scene right i don't know if you can see her right now but my game is simply a 3d scene and i just converted it over to vr so and I'm joggling around my headset and it's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple people asked about time and cost. Now you're developing this yourself. We just saw uh, your prototype. What, what kind of time have you put into to creating this, this to get it to this stage? Um, well, I'm bouncing the, between that and other projects, but um, collectively I want to say about to get it to this stage, about four months of solid work. So, it's not been too bad. Um, I had some 3D character models for and some uh, geometry that I already had kind of going. So I just kind of re-imported that and reskinned it and redid some things. Reskin, when I say reskin, is different in context than an app's reskin, but it's similar in theme. Um, reskinning, yeah. So it's the same same concept. You know, you take your 3D geometry and I had some you know slot machines and I just remapped some new graphics to them. And, made it happen that way got it and as somebody who has 15 years of experience uh what would you say to somebody watching this who wants to get into games maybe it doesn't have to be vr quite yet but what would you say uh somebody who's interested but doesn't quite know where to start needs that kind of push to get into this industry start small start small start small baby steps right don't don't if, if you try and tackle something too big you're going to get disappointed and frustrated you have to start um, you got to walk before you can run and you have to crawl before you can walk. 
So, and where do you crawl? You crawl with something simple. Do a tic-tac-toe game. As simple as that. Do, do a, um, a chess, not, not chess, maybe that's even too advanced. A checkers game, a Tetris game. Make a very simple game, right? Um, something that you already know exists. You, you, already, you already know how it plays out, right? You know the formula. It's, you're just copying right maybe you don't maybe you don't publish it as hey it's my original idea it's not an original idea right blackjack is not an original idea it's not i mean it's not my original idea it's somebody else's original idea so i'm taking an already existing game that i don't have to figure out the rules of the game i don't have to figure out all these things and i'm moving into that space by creating something that's going to be fun and I'm repackaging it in a way that is going to be innovative than traditional blackjack games. The character in this particular game, um, she's going to be very emotive. She's going to be flirtatious. She's going to be smiling. She's going to be, uh, she's going to let you know when you made a wrong move. She's going to make fun when you made a, you know, um, when you lost a lot of money, she's going to do things that are going to spark your emotion. Yeah, that they're going to spark your emotion. Exactly. And you don't see that in traditional blackjack games on mobile because they don't show a 3D dealer character. And if they do, it's, it's very kind of cut and dry. So this is the area that I'm really kind of expanding into that. Yeah. Well, I hope you're not doing too much. I know you're in Vegas. I hope you're not doing too much market research down at Caesars Palace or... <laughs> Yeah, actually, I live like two miles from the Red Rock Casino. So I, I actually went in there and I was looking at the architecture the other day and I say, how can, how, where, if, and I looked at where the dealer tables were and I said, okay, what can I do to kind of frame this really nicely? You know, and that's, and that's kind of said, I looked at the, the room and the space and I said, okay, let me kind of build it out like similar like this. So that was my inspiration for the, uh, the background in here. <laughs> Right on. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, where can people contact you and find you at? Uh, you can find me on Twitter slash polygraphics. That's uh, P-O-L-Y-G-R-A-F-I-X. And uh, you can always email me, P-O-L-Y-G-R-A-F-I-X at gmail.com. Um, I try to answer all my emails. So I'm, I'm friendly, you know, like if somebody has questions or needs help in, in marketing or uh, game development, I'm, I usually answer within a day and you know, try to help out whoever I can. Yeah. Thank you so much for being a part of the community and for answering people's questions in the past. And if you have a question for Michael, just feel free to reach out to him via Twitter or email or drop him a message on the Facebook group and we'll do our best to get you a response. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you, Mark.